Good morning. The title of today's lecture is Exploring Special Subjects on Pompeian Walls, and that's exactly what I'm going to do today, to explore a number of scenes, uh, a, a, a frieze of figures, a, a landscape scene, a portrait, portraits on uh, Pompeian walls, and also still life painting. And we're going to look at them both in the context of the architectural style walls that we've been discussing thus far this term, especially the second, third, and fourth styles, but we'll also look at them as interesting in their own right. We ended last time with a discussion of fourth style Roman wall painting, and I want to show you again what I consider the quintessential fourth style wall. It's the Ixion room in the house of Vedii in Pompeii. Uh, and you see it here once again in all its garish glory. It's an amazing painting. We talked about the fact that it is a kind of compendium of all the styles that went before. We described, for example, the sockel, which is, attempts to imitate marble encrustation in paint, which of course makes reference to the first style of Roman wall painting. We talked about the fact that the second style elements could be seen in the substantial columns that are located in the second tier or in the main <coughs> tier of the painted wall, columns that support a lintel above and a coffered ceiling. We see those here, we see them over here as well. Those again elements of the second style. We talked about the third style features in this particular painting. Uh, the mythological landscape in the center that has a frame, a black frame around it to make it abundantly clear that this is not a window to something else, but rather meant to look as if it is a flat panel painting hanging on the wall. Uh, third style element. Over here another third style <laughs> element, the floating uh, mythological figure in the center in this case of a white panel with a, uh, with a border that is made up of floral or vegetal motifs. Again, elements of the third style. With regard to fourth style, the introduction of architecture once again on either side of the main panel in the main zone. Uh, these are not representations of complete buildings, but rather, as we discussed, fragments of buildings depicted in illogical space. And then in the uppermost tier, uh, we see the architectural cages that we also described as characteristic of the fourth style. So all of these elements, as I said, a compendium of all of these painting styles all in one place is where Roman painting ends up right before uh, the destruction of Mount Vesuvius. We also have looked, in fact, I want to return at the beginning of today's presentation to the Villa of the Mysteries in Pompeii. We've looked at it twice already. We looked at it from the standpoint of its architectural evolution. Uh, we looked at the two phases, first and second phases, of the uh, Villa of the Mysteries. And you'll remember the plan. This is the second phase plan, which I show to you again. Uh, and you'll recall the design uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the villa, uh, where you enter at the top, you enter into the peristyle, then into the atrium, then into the tablinum, this unusual uh, sequence of rooms that is more in keeping with villa design, according to Vitruvius, than to uh, house design. And we looked at uh, a room, a second style wall painted room, uh, called Cubiculum 16, and I can show you where Cubiculum 16 is on this plan. You see it right over here. And you'll remember that this was an outstanding example of mature second style Roman wall painting, this idea of opening up the wall illusionistically. Remnants of the first style wall still here. That wall is dropped down. Uh, we do have substantial columns with proje projecting entablatures. Uh, coffered ceiling above, and in this case, a lintel, and then an arcuated lintel. All of these elements are typical of the second style, and especially the opening up of the wall to see a vista that lies beyond, in this case, a tholos, or round shrine, surrounded by uh, blue sky. So quintessential second style in Cubiculum 16. The room that I want to turn to today, also in the Villa of the Mysteries, is room five. Room 5 is located over here. Uh, you see it right 
to the right of the tablinum and close to the southern side, close to the great bay window that was added in phase two to provide magnificent views out over the sea. Room five, it's this plain rectangular room, or so it looks in plan, fairly large in scale, not as large as the atrium, but fairly large. And while it's on, <coughs> while the plan is on the screen, I just want to point to the <coughs> entranceway to the room, this very small entranceway here. It's actually very important in terms of our decoding of these paintings that, we'll fi that we find in there. Uh, this small entranceway, and then what you see in plan here are actually windows uh, rather than additional doorways. And we're going to see that the designer of this particular room, the painter, uh, took the corners, took the, the location of the door and also the corners of the room and the, and, the, and the location of the windows into great consideration when he painted uh, the scenes on this wall. This is a view of, the, of room five as it looks today. Uh, it's often also referred to as the, uh, the room with the Dion Dionysiac mystery paintings, mystery paintings that we'll see feature the god of wine, Dionysus. You can see from looking at this general view that the paintings are quite well preserved. Uh, we'll see that they cover all four walls of the room, except for the, the space, uh, except for where the windows are, obviously. Uh, and you can also see that this is like nothing we've looked at thus far this semester, in that what we have here are a series of very large monumental figures uh, that seem to walk around the room in a kind of procession. And you see those extremely well here. With regard to the, the uh, style of wall that it is, I show you another view over here where you can see those same large figures. Uh, walking uh, from the doorway along the side of the left wall. Uh, but you can also see the design of the wall as a whole. And if you look at it carefully, you will note that the figures are, of course, placed against these large red panels. Between those red panels, what look not like, they're clearly not columns, but kind of like flat pilasters here. Uh, that resting on a socle down below. And then above, uh, a meander pattern uh, uh, freeze, and above that, uh, a, a, a another a course that represents in paint uh, what looks like variegated marble, variegated marble, the implication being again that would have been very expensive uh, to bring from somewhere else. So as we look at this, we think, well, it's kind of like a first style wall, uh, but you can see that there, it's not a relief wall, it's not built up in stucco, it's flat. Uh, because it was done entirely in paint. And yet, as you look at these very large figures, uh, you see that they are standing on a ground line that projects into the spectator's space. Uh, and that suggests to us that what we are dealing with here, if we have to categorize this and put it into first, second, third, or fourth style, we're going to call it a second style Roman wall painting because it has, again, residual from the first style, but it's done entirely in paint, but it has this projecting element at the bottom, this baseline on which the figures stand and on which the figures <laughs> process. So a second style Roman wall painting with monumental figures, and those monumental <laughs> figures tell a story, and it's a very interesting, very intriguing, very mysterious uh, story indeed. And it is from the mystery scenes here, by the way, that the Villa of the Mysteries uh, got its name. This is a view over here, an excellent view of the small doorway that you need to take uh, to enter into the room. Uh, and as you enter into the room and you make a sharp left, well, first, of course, you enter in the room and you, t you get a, 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 a glimpse of the entire space. Uh, but as you turn to your immediate left, uh, you begin with the beginning of the story. And the artist, again, has orchestrated this in such a way as to make it look like this woman who is standing here has actually entered through the doorway of the room and is now beginning to process uh, from that doorway along the side of the room. If we look at the woman, we see that she is wearing uh, quite heavy, a quite heavy garment over here. Uh, but it's a very jaunty representation of this woman because you can see she has her, her right hand on her hip uh, in an interesting way. 
and then most interesting of all is the fact that she wears a veil over her head and it's a kind of diaphanous veil as i think you can see it's over her head protects her hair uh, and then it wraps uh, around her she wraps it around her chest she's holding uh, one uh, corner of it with her left hand and the rest cascades uh, down her back uh, the artist has paid a great deal of attention to that veil because he wants to identify her for us and to tell us that she is a bride. Brides were often depicted with voluminous veils like that, uh, as you see her here. And she is a bride, uh, as we're going to find out as we interpret uh, these scenes. She is a bride, probably a young Pompeian woman, who is about to enter, who is about to participate in these religious rites that are going to allow her, it's a kind of like a fraternity or sorority initiation that she's about to undergo, let's say a sorority initiation that she's about to undergo, because she's about to go through something that's going to enable her ultimately to enter into a mystical marriage with the god of wine, Dionysus. She enters here. Then she comes upon uh, two other figures. There's a seated woman, as you can see, who holds in her hand, uh, her left hand, a scroll. Uh, she has her right hand on the shoulder of a little boy. Note that the little boy is completely naked and completely oblivious to the fact that he is naked. <coughs> he holds in his hand a scroll, which he has another scroll, which he has unfurled. And it looks as if he is, well, it's, it's no question, he's very intent on looking at the text on that scroll. And it looks as if he is reading from the text of that scroll. And we interpret that scroll, or we interpret his participation in this scene, as probably the fact that he is reading the liturgy, the liturgy that has to do uh, with this cult of Dionysus and with the mystical marriage of women with the god Dionysus. It's a wonderful depiction of that boy. And I also show you here uh, the rest of that particular side of the room. We're going to look at all the figures in order, uh, but I just wanted you to get a sense of the rest of the wall as it unfurls, this left wall as you first come into the room. Uh, and I wanted to point out, using this image, that again, a, 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 about how uh, sophisticated this particular artist was, because he takes into consideration, as I mentioned before, the corners of the room, and they become part of the narrative. Uh, as you can see here, there's an empty space, but, uh, but the storyline, as we'll see, continues across the corner, and the figures over here interact with the figures on the other side of the bend in the wall in, again, a very, very sophisticated and interesting way, and we'll follow that through. Before we do, though, I just want to show you a head detail of the seated woman to give you a sense of the extraordinary talent of this artist whose name, unfortunately, has not come down to us. Uh, we see this head here, and you can see the way in which the artist has captured the moment, what this woman is going through, what she's thinking about. She's seated, she's listening to the liturgy that's being uh, spoken by this boy. Uh, you can see that the artist has paid a great deal of attention to her eyes, which are wide open and very nicely painted. But one gets the sense, or at least I get the sense as I look at this, that she, she is not only wide-eyed at what's going on, but you also have a sense that she's kind of, it's almost jaded. I mean, she's kind of seen it all. She has a sense uh, of what the moment is uh, and what is about to occur. Notice also the way in which her lips are slightly parted. Uh, and especially the hair. The artist, as we'll see, who is responsible for painting this, uh, and it may have been more than one artist, it may have been a designer who worked with, obviously, others in a workshop, but whether it's a single individual or several, it is very clear that this person, uh, or, this person or persons have a very good sense of what hair a, real hair is actually like. It's the same, as I mentioned when we talked about the villa, the, um, the uh, gardenscape of Livia, and I said that that artist had clearly looked at nature and was actually depicting what he saw and knew about nature. Here is somebody, I believe, who has really looked at human beings, who has really looked at the way in which hair grows from the scalp, uh, because you can see the way in which he has shown that hair 
growing from the scalp, and he understands that when you part your hair in, this, in the middle, uh, there may be a, a, a certain part of the scalp that you actually see through the hair. And he has represented that extremely realistically here. So although we don't know the name of this particular artist, we can, we can acclaim uh, his talent here as we look at details such as this one. The story continues from the boy reading the liturgy uh, to the figure that you see here. Uh, it is a figure, again, of a woman. She is holding some kind of a dish, and she has on that dish probably, it's very hard to identify exactly what's there, uh, but she has probably some uh, items that have something to do with this cult, with this mystical marriage uh, of these Pompeian women with Dionysus. She is dressed uh, in, she has a light colored top and uh, a purple, there's a lot of purple in this scene, a very vividly purple uh, skirt, as you can see down here. She is the first woman of the group to wear a laurel wreath over her head, uh, as you can see. And she and all of them, by the way, wear bracelets. You can see bracelets around her lower arm. Some of them wear uh, these arm bracelets up higher on their arms, as we'll also see. And she's one of the only figures that actually looks out at us, the spectator. She really is basically confronting us. We, we link eyes with her when we look at this particular painting. And the artist is obviously trying to establish fairly early on a connection between the viewer and what is happening uh, in this scene. Uh, the beginning of another scene here with a series of women, I have a better view of it here, where you can see what's happening next. Here we have three women who are standing at some kind of a table. And one of the women, the, women, the woman on the right, has a pitcher from which she's pouring some kind of liquid. Whether it's water or wine or what, we're not absolutely sure. It might well be wine, given that this is uh, a my the Mysteries of Dionysus. She may be pouring wine. But whatever it is, uh, it has been interpreted as a purification scene uh, in which something, and we can't see what it is, that's underneath this purple uh, piece of, of, of cloth uh, that, 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 that she, one of the women is, is holding up and revealing. Uh, they are purifying that or uh, either an object or a series of objects on this table. It's a wonderful depiction of these three women, uh, one woman holding the edge of the table over here and looking to her compatriot who is pouring uh, the liquid on this side, and a real tour de force. It's not so easy to depict a figure from the rear and make it work, uh, but this artist has done so, a very monumental woman seated on uh, a wonderful throne here uh, with, the, uh, with the purple uh, uh, hem, as you can see down below. Uh, but look at the way he's depicted her garment. It's tight in some places and molds her body and cascades uh, in others. She's also wearing a scarf that's tied back behind her head, and she too wears a laurel wreath over that scarf. Uh, this woman has a laurel wreath as well. So they're purifying, this. as part of this rite, they are purifying. Women, three women, are participating and purifying uh, these, uh, this object or objects here. This woman has her, her she's, look, she's not really looking as you, well, she isn't looking at what she's doing, as you can see. She's not actually, what, doesn't seem to be watching the purification, but rather is looking at this fellow over here. And given what he looks like, I guess that's not surprising. Her glance is caught by him. Now, who is he? He is what we call a Silenus, S-I-L-E-N-U-S. And a Silenus is an older satyr, S-A-T-Y-R. Who were the satyrs? The satyrs were uh, the, um, the compatriots of uh, Pan, P-A-N, compatriots of Pan. Uh, and uh, so a young satyr grows up into an old Silenus, uh, and you see that Silenus here. And he's a very interesting figure. Uh, you can see that he, he's completely naked. And in fact, they're, well, they're, they're naked men and naked women in this, as, in this, as we'll see. Uh, but it's interesting to see that, uh, you know, which ones are and which ones aren't. He is, and you can see that this great purple mantle that he had draped around his body has completely or almost completely fallen off. He is playing a lyre, as you can see here, and probably singing along with his lyre playing. And not only has his garment fallen off, but you can see that he is not, one foot is on the pedestal on which uh, the, um, or on a base, on which the pedestal that supports the lyre is located. But another leg has slipped off that pedestal. Why is that? He's quite tipsy. 
Uh, we know that the Silenus, uh, the Silenuses and the Satyrs did a lot of drinking, very serious drinking. Uh, he's clearly uh, imbibed, uh, and he is not very much in control of himself any longer, uh, so he's probably pretty oblivious to the fact that his clothing has fallen off uh, and that he too has slipped off the bass as he sings. So it's not surprising uh, that this woman casts her glance uh, towards the goings-on uh, next to her. Here are the, I mentioned that uh, the, uh, I mentioned the satyr, the satyrs, and we see two of the young satyrs right next to that older man. Uh, and the satyrs, again, uh, are associated with Pan. Uh, and goats are also associated with Pan, and you can see one of them is feeding uh, the goats here. These young boys, and it's true of the man too, I neglected to mention it, all have uh, sort of Pan or animal ears. Uh, as you can see very clearly here, the pointed animal ears. And this one is playing a flute. So one playing a flute, one, playing the go one uh, feeding the goats, uh, both of them seated on a kind of rocky uh, area over here. This figure is of particular interest. It's a woman clothed uh, with a white garment that is sleeveless. She has one of these uh, bracelets on the upper part of her arm. Uh, it is clear that she is afraid and she is fleeing from something. Uh, you can see that she holds up her, uh, one of her, her left hand, she holds up her left hand as if she is trying to ward something horrific off. Uh, and you can see that she is, in, uh, but she can't, by the way, while she's holding up her hand to ward it off, you can see that she's absolutely mesmerized by whatever it is that she's seeing. Her eyes are staring. Uh, straight ahead, wide-eyed, staring straight ahead to look at whatever it is that is, uh, at one hand, fascinating on the, and, on the, and, the, and on the other, horrific. Uh, she is clearly in a rush because you can see that the purple mantle that she wore uh, has been caught in the breeze as she, as she tries to escape. Uh, the breeze is caught in that and it almost serves the purpose of a kind of parachute uh, that's about to rescue her uh, from whatever it is that she has seen and that has frightened her. We are now at the first corner of the room. So again, the artist has taken the corner into consideration and created this dramatic uh, interaction between this woman and whatever it is that she's afraid of on the other side of the corner. Uh, and before I show that to you, I just wanted to show you a close-up of her face to again give you a sense of how talented, how extraordinarily gifted uh, this artist was in capturing the moment, uh, in capturing the feelings that this woman must have been going through. Once again, the very wide eyes, fascinated by what she sees, but seemingly all-knowing. She, she's seeing something that she doesn't quite expect, but you get the sense that perhaps she did know all along uh, that she was going to see something of this nature. The parted lips once again, and the expert way in which the artist has shown uh, the way n hair naturally grows out of the scalp of the head, again, achieved uh, magnificently in this head detail. Now, the object of her fear uh, is what we now see over here. Here again, we see the corner, the, the corner itself, an empty red space, the woman fleeing on this side. What is she fleeing from? What is she afraid of? This horrific mask uh, that is being held by one of the satyrs. We see another set of two young satyrs here and an old Silenus again, and one of the satyrs holding up this horrible mask, uh, and that seems to be what has uh, put, put fear into the eyes uh, of this particular woman. With regard to the scene of the satyrs, you can see that the, uh, the, uh, the Silenus and the satyrs, the Silenus is seated on some kind of marble block, as you can see here. He looks very similar to the one that we saw before. An older man with those animal ears, as you can see, uh, and he is, one of the satyrs holds the mask. Uh, all of these figures, by the way, are, 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 are you know, do not have any, are, are semi-naked. You can see that they have bare chests in all cases and the mantles only covering the lower parts of their bodies. And the Silenus, while looking back toward the woman, uh, is holding a large cup 
uh, from which one of the satyrs is drinking. It's a kind of, I always think of this as a kind of Maury's cup. Uh, and you see that the satyr is hold, the Silenus is holding it, the younger satyr is drinking from it. So again, there, there's a, this is a lot to do with, with drinking and getting drunk, this, this mystery. Uh, and uh, at, least, at least from the male point of view, because it actually seems to be the men uh, who are drinking and not the women who are drinking in this particular instance. It's a wonderful, let me also show you a detail of the, sa of the young satyr drinking out of the cup, and you can see how gifted again this particular artist is. I don't think this artist always gets the hands right. He tries. Uh, they're sometimes a little bit awkward. Uh, but on the other hand, he really has made an effort to show the way in which hands and fingers grip something, both from the bottom and also from the top. He's very good with the eyes. Again, you get, uh, it's just wonderful the way he has achieved uh, showing this satyr you know, on one hand, greedily drinking from the cup, but at the same time with one eye, you can see one eye, and that one eye is, you know, very much on what it is that he's doing. He's looking at that liquid quite intently as he drinks it, and I think that's very well achieved here. And again, this extraordinary way in which the artist has depicted uh, the hair of this young man as it grows out of his scalp, particularly talented. You don't see that very often in Roman painting. Uh, the center, this, we're now on the back wall. We've turned the corner, it's the back wall, the wall that you face when you come into the room and look ahead. Uh, and we see that the scene that follows uh, the Silenus and the satyrs with the mask is the scene that you see here. And it is the most important scene uh, in the painting because it is the scene that represents Dionysus himself, this man with whom all of these Pompeian women are anxious to uh, be initiated into his rites and to enter into mystical marriage with him. Here he is, and he is wasted, clearly. I mean, look at him. Uh, you know, despite the fact that he's about to enter into marriage with all these attractive young women, I mean, he's completely out of it. He is lying in the lap of Ariadne, his mortal lover. You see her here. Uh, and uh, look at his eyes, they're sort of rolled up uh, into the top of his head. He, is, he, is, he could, couldn't possibly support himself without Ariadne's help. Uh, his arms are, are, are outstretched behind him. In fact, she has to put her arm around his chest in order to protect him. And I think it's interesting to see the way in which women are, are represented as protective beings in these paintings. The, the woman earlier on who puts her hand around the boy who's reading from the liturgy, and now Ariadne who drapes her arm around, uh, around Dionysus. Dionysus, the god of wine. You can see again that he had a mantle, and that's about it on, but that is slipping off. Uh, and you can also see that he's so drunk that although he's kept one sandal on, he's lost the other sandal. You can see his bare foot over here. You're looking at the bottom of the foot. That sandal is gone, and if you look for it, you can find it. Here it is. Uh, it has fallen off, and it is located uh, closer to Ariadne. Look also at the staff that Dionysus usually carries. Uh, the Thyrsus, T-H-Y-R-S-U-S, -S, the Thyrsus of Dionysus. Uh, it's there and it helps to identify him as does the ivy wreath that he wears, uh, that he typically wears. Note the yellow ribbon that is tied around the Thyrsus. But it do, you know, one wonders how that Thyrsus is being supported because you can see it's, it, I guess it's just leaning slightly against the chair on which Dionysus sits, but one wonders how it is being uh, supported. But it crosses his body here and is meant again as an identifying attribute uh, for the god of wine. The fact that we see Dionysus in this state and also on the lap of Ariadne is interesting, especially the lap of Ariadne, because again, she was his mortal. She herself was a mortal, his mortal lover. And I think one of the ways of interpreting this as that a scene like this, seeing that Dionysus could unite with a mortal woman, gave hope uh, to the women of Pompeii who were hoping to be initiated into this uh, mystical uh, religion and, and to embark on a mystical marriage with Dionysus. This gave them hope that if another mortal woman was allowed to enter into a relationship with Dionysus, then they too would be able to follow in their, in, in uh, Ariadne's footsteps. And so this is a very important message, I think, of hope uh, to those women who are hoping uh, to become initiatives, initiate, initiates, <coughs> initiate, initiates 
of this uh, particular um, cult. The next scene that we see is also a very interesting scene and a very important one. It's the one that comes right to the right of the uh, scene of Dionysus and Ariadne. Uh, and we see here the discovery of the most important cult object uh, in this scene, which is the phallus. We see a woman kneeling. Uh, she is, uh, she, her arms are wonderfully depicted uh, as they um, seem to barely touch uh, whatever it is that lies uh, beneath this uh, purple cloth. We see down below a basket uh, that is certainly the basket in which the phallus, the secret uh, ritual, the most important but secret ritual item uh, in the uh, Dionysiac religion was kept. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of speculation what was behind the purple cloth. Is it an erect phallus? Uh, very possibly, that's exactly what it is that would have been kept again in this basket, but is underneath here. Although the speculation has been so wild that we even have a scholar who has written an article suggesting that the profile of this particular object, uh, this particular cloth here is so similar to the profile of Mount Vesuvius <laughs> that what we have here is a reference instead to Mount Vesuvius and to the fact uh, that this scene takes place in Pompeii. It's a very intriguing idea. I think it's, I, I can't imagine that it's correct, uh, but nonetheless it gives you some sense of the kind of scholarship and some of the speculation uh, there has been about uh, what is actually going on here. But it seems to be uh, the, uh, the covering in this particular case and possibly about to reveal uh, the secret, um, the, the most important uh, secret item uh, in this cult. Over here we see another fascinating figure. We've gotten to another corner and we can see that she straddles the empty red space in that corner. A figure of a woman uh, who is winged, the only winged figure that we see in these scenes. Uh, you can see her large stretched, outstretched wings uh, behind her. She is naked from the waist up. She's wearing a fantastic skirt. I love this skirt. Uh, with, uh, with she has a, with purple around the waist and purple at the hem and then a, a wonderful, it flips out, it's brown and it flips out and it matches these great tall boots, uh, brown boots that she also wears and she's sort of on her tippy toes as she, uh, as she herself puts up one of her hands, perhaps again towards something off, we don't know what, but with the other hand what's most important, she has her hand behind her back and she's about to bring a whip, which you can see, down on the back of one of the initiates. Uh, and as we look across the corner, again the artist masterfully taking the corner into consideration in his design vis-a-vis -vis the content and the execution, uh, we see the way in which that whip is about to come down on the back of one of these initiates who's kneeling and has her uh, head in the lap of a woman uh, who protects her. Here is the scene. So again, we see the figure, the winged figure with the whip. We see the object of the whipping, uh, this initiate here. Uh, she is kneeling. She is in the lap in part of a woman who seems to protect her or try to protect her. The woman who is trying to protect her, her eyes are very wide. She is staring up at the winged figure, imploringly it seems, almost imploring her, please, you know, enough, enough. Please stop. Uh, and she is, uh, she is very nurturing uh, to the young girl who is undergoing this initiation as she pats her on the head, as you can see here. An incredible view of uh, this woman, uh, the way in which the upper part of her body is exposed for the whipping, the rest of it covered in a voluminous purple mantle, as you can see here. Uh, also figures to her right uh, a naked woman who is uh, de who, uh, who is placed in front of, interestingly, a woman, a, a very heavily clothed woman in a dark garment which only serves to accentuate the lightness of this woman's flesh. This, this sort of contrast or tension between clothed and unclothed also seems to play an, a very important part in this particular painting. But this woman is incredible. Again, the artist has, uh, has, has enjoyed uh, <coughs> trying to represent figures from the rear as well as from the front. Uh, and you see uh, he has also uh, shown her on her tippy toes as she is, she, well, she has symbols above her head and she's crashing those symbols. Uh, and then she is dancing on her tip, on her tip toes 
down here, but it's an incredible feat because she also has this uh, gold mantle uh, that is over her shoulder and between her legs, and somehow she's keeping this mantle <laughs> balanced as she is dancing and as she is playing her music. Uh, and then there's another one of an, an, another thyrsus of Dionysus that seems to be located that is located between these two women, and one wonders again how in the world that thyrsus is being held up uh, as this woman is uh, participating in this um, in this dance and music making over here at the right. To get back to this figure, I just want to show you a detail because I think in this detail you really get almost more than anywhere else in this painted frieze the extraordinary talent of this particular artist. I mean, here, here the artist gets these hands really right. Uh, you can see this, the limp hand of the woman being whipped uh, almost says it all. It's an incredible detail, as does the more nurturing hand of the woman who is trying to protect her. Uh, and I think you can get a sense of what she must be going through uh, by the way in which the artist has represented her face. He has cast her eye. Her eyes are, this is one of the only closed eyes. It, it may be the only closed eye in the scene. Her eye is closed or almost closed, uh, and it is, it is sunken. It seems to be sunken in a, in a darkness here uh, that gives you some sense of the pain uh, that this woman must be going through. Pain that she obviously feels, however, is worth it. And look also at the way in which the hair has been depicted here. You really get the sense of sweat-drenched hair uh, of this woman, again, who's going through what is almost certainly the most difficult moment in her life, but one that she hopes uh, is going to, uh, to be well worth it at the end of the day. It's an incredible detail, I think. After that scene, uh, there's a window. And then at the very end of that wall, we're now on the, facing the room on the right wall of the room, uh, there is one last corner, and we see here what is represented across that one last corner. It is a very young woman seated on a kind of a throne here. She has an attendant standing next to her, and then there's a small winged cupid at the left. And then across the corner, we see another cupid, standing on a base, leaning on a pedestal, winged again, he's, his, his head and his on, on resting on one of his hands, and he is looking across the corner at what is going on on the other side. And he looks very, very admiring. And in fact, who is he admiring? He's um, admiring another one of these young initiates, a young woman who seems to be readying herself to become a bride, who's getting ready uh, for her initiation. She wears a glorious uh, golden garment uh, that is wrapped and wrapped around her waist is a purple, a purple tie, uh, a purple ribbon or tie, as you can see here. Uh, she is again accompanied by another woman, an attendant, uh, and the two of them together are are actually fixing her hair uh, to get her ready again for her mystical marriage. I have a detail of her to show you in a moment. And then this wonderful anecdotal detail here where we see the other Cupid, uh, wing it again, holding up a mirror in his hand, uh, a rectangular mirror. And if you look very, very closely, and you can study this detail on your own as well, if you look very closely, you can see that there is a reflection of the young woman's face uh, in that mirror. Uh, so a, a, lot of, a, a lot of attention being paid to the readying of this woman to be a bride, to enter into the mystical marriage with Dionysus. And we see a detail here where we can see her, see how pretty she is, see how uh, her, again, the artist has shown this extraordinary ability to uh, depict hair as it really is growing out of her scalp. You can see the part of her hair, the scalp showing through, the way in which the hair grows from that. And then you can see that not only is she working on arranging it, but she's getting help uh, from the attendant. The attendant also has a, a section of her hair in her hand, and the two of them together are trying to get her ready for her mystical marriage. Her arm is up. You can see both of her bracelets, and, and one around her wrist, and then another bracelet up on the upper part of her arm. Then we have another window, and then the last figure, the last figure that we see uh, is this woman here, uh, a woman who is seated on a very elaborate throne. 
Uh, she too is veiled. She has, uh, again, a, a combination gold and purple garment, bracelets. She's wearing bracelets. But she is veiled. Uh, so again, the implication is she too is a bride. She seems very placid. She seems somehow a little bit older than some of the other brides. And what has been speculated, and she's very pensive. You can see she leans one, she leans her chin on one of her hands. She seems to be sitting there, you know, all, right at right at the again, again the the doorway of the room. She seems to be seated there and basically surveying everything that's happening in front of her. And because she looks a little bit older, because she looks a little bit wiser, uh, because she is looking out at, a pa at the panorama of what's happening in front of her, it has been speculated, and I think quite convincingly, that the woman we see here is probably the matron of the house, probably the wife of the man who owned and built uh, the Villa of the Mysteries in Rome, uh, in Pompeii, who was herself uh, pr an adherent to the cult of Dionysus and has set aside this secret room in her house uh, for the cult of Dionysus in which she can help initiate other young women uh, into this mystery cult. Just one, a couple of quick words about uh, religion and cults uh, during this period. The Roman religion was the Roman state religion. Everyone essentially adhered to the Roman state religion, which was very closely allied with the government uh, of Rome. Uh, so church, uh, church and state very closely allied uh, in, in Roman times. But as time went on, a number of religions that emanated from other parts of the empire, especially the Eastern Empire, the cult of Dionysus, the cult of the Egyptian goddess Isis, began to take hold, both for men and women. Women had a particular predilection for the Egyptian goddess Isis and for the Dionysiac mystery religions. And initially, because they were not accepted by the state, the only uh, religion that was con considered legitimate was the Roman state religion. Since they weren't uh, uh, accepted by the state, and this included Christianity, these religions had to be uh, celebrated in, or had to be, the rites had to be done in secret. Uh, and so we see underground rooms, underground buildings being uh, built for this purpose. I'll show you one a bit later in the course. Uh, but we also see rooms in houses being set aside uh, for these kinds of rites. And that seems to be what happened here. The woman of the house, the matrona, uh, the mater familias of this particular family who lived in the Villa of the Mysteries, has set aside room five uh, as this secret chamber uh, in which she can practice the Dionysiac rituals and she can also encourage other women in Pompeii uh, to partake of those same rituals. I just, just, I just, I put on your monument list. You'll see uh, a image of the a drawing of all of these scenes that I've now gone through in order, and I think it's helpful for you to have that as a reference, uh, just to be able to follow along again the narrative and where uh, each of the scenes that we've described comes up. And then just one last view of the room as a whole. Uh, I bring it back because I just wanted to end our discussion of this particular monument with the point that uh, this is really quite unique in terms of the paintings that we've seen thus far this semester. That is to have a painting uh, with such monumental figures that tells the story that this particular painting does. Uh, and I, it's such a famous set of paintings that, mo that I think because people know it so well, they think, well, that, that must be comparable to other things from Roman times. But this is the only painting that we have like this. It doesn't mean that there might not have been others, but I think it probably means that there weren't a lot of others, that this was truly an exceptional work of art uh, that is preserved in the Villa of the Mysteries at Pompeii. I want to show you uh, in the half an hour that remains a, a, a number of other paintings much in much less detail. Uh, but paintings that also are of special subjects, that also belong to second, third, or fourth style walls, and they're particularly interesting in a variety of ways. The first of these is also mythological in subject matter. I'm going to show you the so-called Odyssey paintings. We're moving back to Rome. These are located on, in a house on the Esquiline Hill, one of Rome's original seven hills <coughs> in Rome. Uh, and while I don't I think I neglected to give you a date for the mystery paintings, but those are 60 to 50, and these paintings are a little bit later, 50 to 40 BC. They are also extremely interesting uh, because they seem to represent 
uh, uh, scenes from the 10th and 11th book of Homer's Odyssey. And Vitruvius, the architectural theorist writing in the Age of Augustus, Vitruvius tells us that the Greeks were particularly interested in representing the wanderings of Odysseus in landscapes. Uh, so he tells us that's very important for us to know because it means that the Greeks painted paintings like this, uh, illustrations of uh, Odysseus's wanderings. And yet we see one of these paintings in this house uh, on the Esquiline Hill in Rome between 50 and 40 BC. The books 10 and 11 focus on Odysseus's uh, coming upon the Lystragonians. I put that name on the monument list for you, the Lystragonians, uh, and what happens when he meets the Lystragonians. Uh, and we see one of the scenes here. We see, in fact, that several scouts uh, working for Odysseus uh, get off their boats on an island, and they come across this beautiful young woman uh, who is who is, has just fetched, you can see she's holding a pitcher, she has just fetched water from a well. And she's walking down this mountain and, and she comes upon these scouts of Odysseus. Uh, and uh, being a friendly sort, she says to them, I'd like to invite you back to my father's house for dinner. Well, her father is a man-eating giant, as are the other Lystragonians. And the scouts fall for it and they come with her uh, to meet her father. And uh, the father uh, immediately cooks up one of the three for dinner. <coughs> and uh, other various other adventures, you know, happen uh, on this island. But what's particularly interesting for us is the fact that uh, these, these scenes, again, are from a well-known work of literature. But the figures are are very small in relation to the landscape. It's clear that the artists, whether the you know, originally Greek artists, were particularly interested in the landscape and the telling of a narrative across that landscape, uh, a landscape that is magnificently rendered, as you can see, uh, by these artists. There are a number of scenes still preserved. Uh, after that dinner, by the way, where one of the scouts uh, gets, um, gets um, consumed, uh, after that, the Lystragonians uh, decide that they don't want any more of Odysseus and his, and his, uh, his crew, uh, and they take boulders, as you can see in this scene here, and they begin to attack uh, the ships of Odysseus, destroying most of them, and only the one with Odysseus himself is able to escape, uh, and he makes his way uh, at that point uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to another island to meet up with the enchant en enchantress Circe. So we see all of this very carefully described here. But as we look at these scenes, I think we're particularly struck, or at least I'm particularly struck, and I would imagine you'll share this, by the interest of this artist in depicting the landscape. We have an artist again, uh, whether it's the original Greek artist, but certainly copied here by uh, an artist in Rome, uh, we see an incredible interest in landscape by someone who is clearly not only looking at earlier models, but looking at landscape itself, and is very interested in depicting all kinds of anecdotal details. Uh, inlets of water, as you can see here, uh, rocks and the way in which uh, the rock is cast in shadow on one side and is lighted on the other, the way in which branches bend both when people pull on them or when they are, they are uh, buffeted by the breeze or by the wind, as you can see uh, with that tree at the uppermost part of the peak. So again, the artist here particularly interested in nature and in the display of nature, and in that way very comparable to what we saw in uh, Livia's gardenscape at the villa at Prima Porta. I mentioned already that, that it is believed that these paintings on the Esquiline Hill are based on Hellenistic Greek models that probably were made in about 150 BC, so a copy, and in that regard should strike you as very much uh, the same trend as we've seen so often in the beginning of this semester uh, of the Romans looking back and admiring Greek art and incorporating it, a kind of Hellenization of Roman art and architecture because of this reverence and because of this incorporation of earlier Greek uh, scenes and prototypes. And so we see that here. And, one, and, and there are three reasons that scholars believe uh, that what we're looking at here is based very closely on a Greek model. 
Uh, one of those is that passage in Vitruvius that I already mentioned, that Vitruvius tells us that the Greeks were particularly interested in representing uh, scenes from the Odyssey against a landscape background. So that certainly tells us that it's likely uh, that these are, are based on, uh, on uh, earlier uh, Greek originals. The second has to do, you've probably noticed this, with the fact that many of the figures in these paintings are labeled. Uh, and those labels are, if you look very closely, you will see, in Greek. And not only are they in Greek, but some of the words are misspelled. So since those words are misspelled, it has been speculated, and I think, again, quite convincingly, that those are, who are misspelling them don't really know Greek, uh, and maybe uh, Roman artists who are not familiar with that language are copying it and making mistakes in the process. So that also suggests to us that earlier Greek models are being looked at, absorbed, and even copied here. But most interesting of all, for us aficionados of the second style, uh, is the fact that very careful, uh, 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 the archaeologists who have looked at these with great care have determined that the landscape scenes that we've studied uh, are continuous beneath the columns. That when they copied these, they copied, perhaps they had a scroll. Uh, that they had from somewhere else, a Greek scroll that came from a library that had you know, images on it, and they unfurled that scroll, and they copied it here. They did that first. They copied, so we had a continuous landscape scene, and it was only after that landscape scene was painted that the artist went back and painted the columns on top. They put these Greek paintings of, or copies of these Greek paintings of Odysseus's wanderings based on this Greek prototype of the mid-2nd century BC, uh, they put it into a Roman context by providing these second uh, style wall, uh, second style uh, uh, columns or pilasters, pilasters I believe, pilasters, uh, by creating these second style pilasters and making this into a vista or panorama that would have been seen through the window, in a sense, of a uh, second style painting. So it's a Romanization uh, of, a, uh, of an original Greek painting uh, in, in an extraordinary way that tells us a good deal about how the Romans were thinking about uh, these Greek prototypes at this particular juncture. I showed you last time the uh, Villa de Plantis, the Caldarium 8, uh, and we looked at the soffit of Caldarium 8, and we saw uh, floating mythological figures, and we saw women in niches with shells at the top. And I pointed out to you at that time uh, that we also have a number of small panel pictures representing still lives with fruit and the like. Uh, and these get, in a sense, get lost in the overall scheme of these second, third, and fourth style walls, but they're very interesting if we look at them in, su in greater detail. And I want to show you just uh, uh, two examples today. This is a, a, it's blown up obviously way beyond uh, the size that it was, uh, but it gives you some sense of what these look like in detail. It's a still life painting that comes from the villa of Julia Felix in Pompeii, which dates to around 50 BC. And, we, uh, and it probably, we do believe that it, it is a detail from a second style wall. Uh, and we look at that detail here, and we see that these, uh, th for those of you who enjoy modern art, for example, I think you'll agree that this is as, tends to be as modern as Roman art gets, uh, because we see it has a very contemporary uh, appearance, I think, this particular still life painting. We see that the artist has shown a striking uh, penchant for, or a sensitivity for composition, uh, for light, the way in which light uh, it falls on objects of, that are made of different materials, be it metal or stone. Uh, the artist has shown that kind of sensitivity, I think, here, as well as to composition, the way in which a group of objects are composed in relationship to one another. If we look at this painting, I think we'll agree it's quite a tour de force. We see uh, some interesting things which are not that easy to decipher. Uh, we see over here, for example, a cloth with fringe that hangs on a nail on the wall. Uh, we see over here also hanging on the wall four dead birds. We see a plate of, uh, an oval plate of what seem to be eggs. 
Uh, we see a pitcher over here, which again, it looks like a metal pitcher bathed in light on one side with a handle. And then we see here what looks like some kind of a beaker uh, with a, something that may have been used to stir whatever liquid was inside. All of this on a stone pedestal. And then leaning against that stone pedestal, we see a, one of these clay, amp, clay uh, vessels, which seems to have an inscription on that clay vessel. So what is this uh, still life painting? Is it just meant to be uh, a mix of objects that would be found in the kitchen of a house? Uh, or is it something more than that? Do these have meaning beyond that? Is there some religious symbolism here, for example? This is not easy to decipher, and no one really has done that satisfactorily up to this point. Uh, but it's something that one would want to keep in mind as one thinks about uh, the meaning of these still life paintings. And keep in mind, again, uh, if you think back to a room like the Ixion Room, there are a number of these small panel paintings in the Ixion Room. When you look at the room as a whole, these are not easy to see. They're, they're so small that they're lost in the overall scheme. So you'd really have to go up very close uh, to these if you could even reach them. If they're way up in the top, it would be difficult. But if they're down below, go up close, look at them, uh, and try to figure out for yourself exactly what is going on here. Another one. Uh, from, in this case, from Herculaneum, which is not, not so ingeniously called uh, still life painting with peaches and glass jar, but that's very descriptive. That's exactly what it depicts, which is later in date around 62 to 79, and probably was a panel in either a third or a fourth style uh, Roman, uh, uh, Roman painting, more Roman painted wall. Uh, we see two tiers here. We indeed do see uh, peaches, and the artist, again, has really looked at peaches to depict this. Uh, shows the peaches on the vine uh, with the leaves, as you can see here, and wants to make sure that we know what a peach looks like inside as well, so has cut uh, a section off one of these and shows the pit inside, just to make sure that we get a full sense of, of how peaches grow uh, and uh, of what happens when you, when you open a peach. And then down here below, a glass vase. And you can see that the artist has filled that vase halfway with water so that he can explore uh, the effects of light on that water and the reflection of that water on the glass uh, vase itself. So clearly, again, artists, that there, there, there may be other reasons that they uh, juxtapose these particular items, these reasons that may be beyond our comprehension uh, today. But while they may do that for ritual or other reasons, they also are clearly very concerned with just exploring composition, light, uh, and so on and so forth, as I said before, which is a very, which, which is a very modern thing uh, to do. We also see among the paintings that I've called special subjects today, uh, genre scenes, scenes that represent daily life in Pompeii or Herculaneum. I'll show you just one of those here. It is a painting of, <coughs> it's usually called a painting of a magistrate distributing free bread. Uh, and it comes from House 7330 in Pompeii, a wall painting from 7330. Pompeii dates to around A.D. 70. And what's depicted here, whether the magistrate is distributing free bread or it's bread being sold, we're not absolutely sure. But what you can see here is piles and piles of round breads that are being distributed uh, to those who stand uh, in front of the uh, bread stand. And I can show you a detail also of the same where you can get a better sense of the shape of the breads. You remember the petrified? petrified bread uh, that we looked at from Pompeii and the, um, the division into shapes that make it resemble a pizza. Uh, the same kinds of breads can be seen here, and it's those, that bread that is being distributed uh, to these people down below. While this, while this painting comes from a house, uh, there, you know, and it may have, been, you know, may have just referred to the particular profession of someone who lived in that house, but paintings like this, we believe, and it may or may not have been the case with this one, uh, could also have were also used as shop signs to advertise uh, what was being sold in one of those tabernae uh, that opened off, off that often opened off houses in places like Pompeii and Herculaneum, and that may have been the case here as well. Just a few words about what we might call history painting uh, among the Romans. This is a fascinating and very famous painting 
of the amphitheater at Pompeii. You see it on the left-hand side of the screen. It comes from House 1323 in Pompeii and dates to between 59 and 70 A.D. And it purports not only to represent uh, the Pompeii Amphitheater, which I remind you of here, and you'll recall the very distinctive staircase of the amphitheater at Pompeii, and you can see how carefully that is rendered here by the artist to make sure that we know this is indeed the amphitheater at Pompeii. It purports to represent a very famous historical event, at least, for, in, at least in terms of local history, and that is a brawl that broke out between the Pompeians and a, uh, another group of individuals who lived in the area called the Nutureans, N-U-C-E-R-I-A-N-S. The Pompeians and the Nutureans, a brawl broke out between them. You can see that brawl being represented in the Oval Arena there. The brawl was so serious that the local uh, magistrates decided to punish both the Pompeians and the Nutureans, and they did something quite extraordinary, and that is that they decided to close down the amphitheater in Pompeii for 10 years. Count them. I mean, can you imagine uh, the city of Pompeii without an amphitheater for 10 years? That was uh, a very brutal uh, punishment. But it seems to have happened, uh, and it is memorialized. That very event is memorialized in this painting uh, in this house at Pompeii. This uh, painting is also very valuable. I think I've mentioned this to you before. It's also very valuable not only for showing us the shape of the, uh, of the uh, amphitheater, which of course, as you know, still survives, the oval shape and the seating, but for, an, uh, for a detail that doesn't still survive, and that is the awning. I mentioned to you that an amphitheater design, uh, they put poles at the very uppermost part of the amphitheater, and they would, were able to put an awning on those poles to protect people in uh, inclement weather. And we see uh, the representation, our only preserved representation in paint, uh, of one of these awnings. Uh, so it, again, is very valuable in terms of helping us understand uh, amphitheater design. The last two paintings I want to show you today are both portrait paintings. And you have to think of these portrait paintings like the mythological panel pictures, as paintings that were inserted into walls, uh, or inserted into uh, probably mostly third and fourth style Roman walls. And it, when, all of, when those treasure hunters hit Pompeii and Herculaneum, these were the ones they went to first. They, they, they cut a, a fair number of these out of their original context and, and made off with them. But some of them, fortunately, have found their way into, especially into the Naples Archaeological Museum. This is the first one that I want to show you, an absolutely fetching uh, portrait of a young woman from Pompeii. Uh, that dates to around uh, the middle of the first century A.D., that is 45 to 50 A.D., uh, and we see it here, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible uh, painted portrait by clearly, once again, a very talented artist who's done an extraordinary job of capturing uh, <coughs> this woman. It's a very, a very, very uh, appealing portrait. We see her. She's a quite attractive young woman with wide, uh, sort of hazel-colored eyes. Uh, sharp, uh, straight brows, um, a straight nose, of sort of a cupid's, uh, cupid's lips. As you can see down below, the hair is magnificently rendered. You can see that she has uh, a bevy of corkscrew curls. Those in the front toward the front of her face are highlighted uh, and match very well the color of her eyes. Uh, she wears gold hoop earrings that also mimic the curlicues of her locks. Uh, and then you can see also that she wears something that appears to have been fashionable to wear among Ma Roman and Pompeian women, and that is a gold hairnet uh, at the very apex, which adds uh, shine and, and, and a glimmer uh, to her port to the hair. Uh, but also you can see the hair b beneath it through that. Down below, you can see she wears a green garment and a, uh, a, a sort of purple or, or brownish mantle over her shoulder. And she holds a stylus to her lips, uh, and she has in her other hand uh, a, um, a uh, as you can see, a tablet uh, in front of her. And she is, it is clear as she puts that stylus to her lips, she is deep in thought, very pensive, uh, figuring out what it is that she's going to write on her wax tablet, because these were wax, and they would write into the wax tablets. Because she is caught in this moment of uh, deep thought, 
Uh, a number of scholars have suggested that she must represent the Greek poetess Sappho, uh, which is why I have put that painted portrait of Sappho on your monument list. But you can see I put Sappho in quote marks. I think this is almost certainly not Sappho. Uh, it is probably a Pompeian woman, and she may not be thinking about the poetry that she's about to write, but perhaps the shopping list uh, that she's putting together before she makes her way uh, down to the central market of the city of Pompeii, or sends her slave to go down to the central market of the city of Pompeii. But it may also be that she was literate, uh, and that she wants to underscore the fact that she was literate. It may also be that this was just a set way of representing women uh, in portraiture in Pompeii, because this is not the only portrait we have of a woman with her stylus to her lips and her tablets in her hands. Here's a, another uh, portrait that we have also from Pompeii uh, with a woman represented in exactly the same way. This portrait is from House 7260 and dates to around 62 to 79 A.D. The portrait of a woman and presumably her husband by her side. She again has the stylus to her lips. She has the tablet down below. You can see that he holds a scroll which has a, um, a red place marker uh, up above. Uh, so this portrait of the two of them may either uh, allude to the fact that they are both literate, that they can both read and write, it's also possible that the, uh, that the scroll that he ho holds may indicate that he's a magistrate. Or lastly, and one of the more popular solutions, is that this may, he may be holding the marriage uh, certificate, uh, the marriage between the two. Uh, the portraits are very interesting. You can see that she isn't quite as gorgeous as her other counterpart. Um, her hair is not arranged in those wonderful uh, golden locks, but are kind of frizzy over her forehead uh, and down her neck. As you can see here, her ears stick out. She has a unibrow. Uh, but she's, she's, she's more than happy to be represented as she was, preserved for posterity as she was, uh, along uh, with her husband over here. And if you look at the portrait, you will see again that it has a black frame around it and then a maroon frame, which tells us again that this was inserted into a wall, uh, a third or fourth style wall, uh, just like the mythological paintings were inserted into those walls uh, as, a, uh, as a painting that was located in the center of that wall, and in this case emphasized uh, the, the owners of this particular house uh, and their, uh, their undying love for each other, their relationship honors their marriage, uh, and served you know, as the kind of counterpart to a portrait of the loving couple that one might put on a mantelpiece or on a piano uh, in one's house today. So you have to think of it as quite comparable to that. Again, when you wander through Pompeii, you don't see many of these portraits in situ, in large part because they were so popular with treasure hunters. But fortunately, we do have a few preserved uh, in, uh, from both Pompeii and Herculaneum, and those can be seen in museums like Naples today. Thank you.